Good afternoon in Europe, Vienna or Spain or France, wherever you are. Good morning in the US and in Southern America. And good night or good morning as well in Japan. So we are in number four of our lecture, <coughs> our course on books and differential equations. After the break, I will recall first what we did last time. So this was the case of Euler differential equations. And then today we will go on to general equations and show, at least in a particular case, how we will be able to solve and find all solutions of these equations. We will do only first a special case because the general case is a little bit more complicated from the notational part of view. There is an ingredient which is a little bit delicate, but we will do it next time. So I hope that you can hear me well and uh, that everything works with the camera. And uh, by the way, about the exercise session, so we had two weeks ago, we had one, but there was not too much feedback. Uh, so if you would like to have, again, exercise sessions next week, please send me an email. It's not a problem, but we only do it if there's really an interest of at least some of you. And uh, you look a little bit at the exercises in advance. We will also try to provide written solutions to at least part of the exercises so you can look up after you have thought about the exercises and con can compare your solution with those which are on the website. The website was down during the weekend, but now it works again, so please go there. We also have already three, three files of notes of the course so far, and again, the course of today will appear soon. Usually, the recordings <coughs> will be only ready one day after, after the original class because there is some technicality we have to handle. Okay, so what did we do last time? Last time, we looked at Euler operators. So what was this? Let me just refresh a little bit what we did. So we had E. Let me write it like this, some ci, xi, del i, I immediately take it like this, i from 0 to n in <coughs> O del, even though it's just monomial coefficients, be an Euler operator. So this means that the I here, I already have chosen it in this way, that the, the power of the monomial and the power of the order of the differential operator is always the same. Okay? In this case, everything is more or less combinatorial. So we define chi, chi of e, the initial polynomial, which was some i from 0 to n, ci. And then we take some variable, maybe I call it t. And here we take for the factorial. Okay, so this is a polynomial in, we are always working over the complex numbers in CT. And then we can look at its solutions. <coughs> so let me call them, so this is the initial polynomial. And of course, E sends monomials x to the k will be something x to the k, yeah, because shift is 0, shift equals 0 without a loss of generality. So it sends monomial to monomial. And that's particularly easy situation. We take the roots of our initial polynomial, row 1 up to what is my index, doesn't matter, row k in C, the roots of chi with multiplicity let me call it mi one or higher so if the all the roots are simple roots that's maybe the easiest case but in general it will be uh, with multiplicities then a c basis of solutions of the equation 
ui equals 0 is given by the monomials. And of course, these monomials are generalized monomials times logarithms. So we have x to the rho, x to the rho log x. And this goes up x rho log x, and now m rho minus 1, rho in omega, some exponent, local exponent. And of course, once you have these, it's immediate to show that there are solutions and that they are a basis. The interest is solving a differential equation when it is not Euler. Okay? So maybe we could write that's easy. No? So we have two things which will appear here, or three. First, we have these complex exponents, so note. Complex exponents. And in the time of Fuchs and Frobenius, this was just acceptable. And then we have powers of logarithms. And we know very well which powers occur up to degree m rho minus 1. Okay. So we control completely the situation. Now, let's go to the general case. And the general case will be a differential operator with arbitrary holomorphic uh, coefficients. Let me call it L. Maybe I just take it like this. O and L, O, we take the germs of holomorphic functions at zero, or converted power series. However you prefer, and we will also do it in the formal setting in the sense uh, that we will also consider the completion of O, which is Cx, formal power series. You can think even of a different field. You may think of arbitrary ground field. Yeah, whenever you are for this formal power series. But then you have to distinguish two situations, either of characteristic 0, and then everything goes in the same way as it goes over the complex numbers, or of characteristic p positive. And this second case, I'm not sure when I will come to the second case is much more complicated and also more interesting. But already, the complex case of characteristic 0 is quite fun. OK. So <clears throat> expand L according to shifts. So I write L equal L0 plus L1, plus L2, and so on. So this one will have shift S0, S1, S2. And we, so these are integers. And we order them strictly. And the L0 will play a particular role. L0, or each of them Euler each of them 
very low. And L0 was called the initial form of L, and to be precise, at 0. We are doing everything locally at 0. You can do it globally, but not at the moment. And then the initial polynomial of L is defined as the initial polynomial of L0. So chi L, and I should say at 0, is defined as chi of L0. Okay. You neglect the other terms for the moment. And then you get, of course, local exponents, local exponents of L again at 0 are the roots of chi L equal chi L0. So <clears throat> when, you, when you look at books and literature about Fuchsian differential equations, there is a whole, whole <clears throat> discussion about choosing different points and how many singular points a differential operator may have. We will come to this point, which is also interesting, for instance, for hypergeometric equations, that you look at this operator L uh, on projective space. For instance, you assume that the coefficients are polynomials, and then you look on P1, and you look at how many singular points you will have. And that's very interesting, but it's more like a global theory. Yeah? And you may have two, three, four uh, singular points. Okay. So at the moment, I did not tell you what singular means. I will also recall this. So what is clear is that the L0, the order of the differential operator L0, will not be larger than the order of L. So, oh yeah. So note, order of L0, so the highest, highest order derivative which appears in L0 as L0 is part of L is less than or equal to Now, the definition which Fuchs gave, I go over this again and, and because you really have to keep it in mind. So <clears throat> zero is a regular singularity of L. So there are various characterizations the original one was uh, Ly equals 0 as a basis of moderate local solutions at 0. We were talking already about what moderate means, but we don't need it now. But one thing which is uh, more explicit and algebraic is the order of L0 equals the order of L. So you can take this as a definition. And this means so whenever you have a differential operator or a differential equation, the highest order term, so the highest derivative, plays a crucial role. Now, if the order of L0 is much less than the order of L, then you don't capture the flavor of L with L0. No? But if the order is the same, we will see that L0 is a very good approximation of L. So you can work with L0, you can work with the solutions of L0, y equals 0, to get the solutions of L, y equals 0. Now, you can formulate this also if L is some ai of x del i, i from 0 to n, then the condition is, I always mix it up, the order of the pole. 
So you divide by the leading coefficient, pole of Ai divided by An is at most is less than n minus i. Okay. And it tells you something different also. Now, this is a corollary of what we said last time, but if L0 has order n, then the sum of the multiplicities of the local exponents will be n. So let me write it down here. M rho, rho in omega, omega is my set of local exponents, omega L0, if you want. Yeah. Local exponent, as you have L0 has order n. The initial polynomial has the same degree as L0, so has its order, so chi will have n roots counted as multiplicity. This is equal to n. So this has the following consequence. I put it in brackets. The, the, the basis of solution of L0 of y equals 0, basis of L0 of y equals 0, I just indicated it before. This basis has the same length, has length, equal to the order of L. And the order of L is the expected dimension of the solution space of Ly equals 0. You are familiar with the fact that the, whenever you have a differential equation of order L, we did this already through the Bronskin matrix. Then you expect at most n linearly independent solutions, and the full space of solutions should have dimension equal the order equal n. Okay, so this note here tells you that we have a chance whenever we have a regular singularity, we have a certain chance to go from the solutions of L0 y equals 0 to solutions of L y equals 0. Okay? So the idea is lift the solutions of L0 y equals 0, which are well known. Two solutions of L y equals zero. Okay, any questions so far? So <clears throat> before I go to the main theorem which we are going to prove today, let me do some examples. So Whenever you try to prove or to understand the proof of some theorem or some result, uh, a good understanding is achieved when you have the feeling that you have should found the proof yourself. And you say, oh, why didn't I think of this? No? So that's always a signal that you have really understood. So with these examples, I will give you some hints how to approach this problem. OK? So let me. Let me stay a little bit on this notion of regular singularity just to get a feeling what's going on. Number one, we take x to the k, y prime plus y equals 0. So this one here has shift 0. This one has shift k minus 1, because we derive once, and it has, has regular singularity, always at 0 now, if and only if k is at most 1. So you have 
x y prime plus y equals zero, or y prime plus y equals zero. So uh, you see, the leading exponent is the, the leading monomial does, should not be a high power of x. Number two, let's take order two. Let's think of x k y double prime plus x m y prime plus y equals zero. So I adjust it. We have again here shift zero. Here we have m minus one. Here we have k minus two. Okay. So when does this have a regular singularity? Regular singularity. So you have two conditions, xm, xk has whole of order less than 2 minus 1 equals 1. And then we have 1 over, when we take this one, 1 over xk as pole of order less than 2, 2 minus 0, 2. So we get this is equivalent to k is at most 2, and m is at least k minus 1. So in case, the interesting case is when k is 2, hence, if k is 2, m must be at least 1. OK? So just to give you a little bit of feeling what's going on. The, the critical entrance is always this one here, yeah, because you divide the whole equation by this one. <clears throat> now, number three is uh, of a different flavor. So we take x square y double prime plus 3xy prime plus y minus xy equals 0. So this is ly. Now, what do we see here? The shifts are 0, 0, 0, plus 1, yeah, because we multiply with x. So L0 will be this part. And the L1 of y is this part. So now we are no longer in the situation of an Euler equation. Yeah, and we have to see how this term here, huh, this L1 of y, how this one destroys or changes the solutions of L0 y equals 0. Okay? So here, in this example, we can easily compute the local exponents. So if you are thinking of a birthday present for me, uh, I would like to have a larger light board. But it's fine like this also. But I have to erase quite often. So <clears throat> chi is, now I write it already in terms of rho, rho and rho minus 1 plus 3 rho plus 1. It is rho plus 1 square, so we have rho equals minus 1 and m rho equals 2. Okay. So the Euler equation, L0y equals 0 has solutions x minus 1. Let me call it y1. And y2, x minus 1, log x. But obviously, these solutions will not satisfy Ly equals 0. Now, you are always allowed to look up in the literature. Yeah? And what do Fuchs and Frobenius tell you? Fuchs, Frobenius. And one should also mention Tomé, even though he is not as famous and prominent as Fuchs and, and Frobenius. He, they give, in this special case, just order two, 
they tell you what are the solutions. Y1, the solutions of L, Y equals 0. So essentially, you take these two and you change them a little bit. Y1 is x to the minus 1 h 0 of x. The 0 corresponds to the power of the logarithm, h 0 in O holomorphic. And y2 is x minus 1, a new holomorphic function, plus x minus 1 log x, h0 of x. So h0 and h1, both holomorphic. So you see that uh, you get a quite precise description of the solution. Of course, you. To compute h0 and h1, you have to do it iteratively. You cannot compute all the terms, yeah, but you have an algorithm to compute them. And moreover, these have, uh, have a constant term, so h0 of 0 is non-zero, and h1 of 0 is non-zero. Okay. So it really starts with 1, to the 1 over x and then higher order terms. Okay, and the hi are given essentially by ansatz, and then you solve stepwise. So one striking fact is that here the same h zero appears yeah, in the two solutions, and the other one is that you just really start from the Euler equation, and you get this here. Okay? We are not so much interested in what h0 and h1 are. In general, you cannot tell it. Here, if I did not make a, an error, uh, you get for h0 of x would be some k from 0 to infinity 1 over k factorial square x to the k. And that's, of course, very convergent. And h1 of x, I did not compute it. Maybe we do it as an exercise, or you, you start a computer program to do it. OK? So we want to understand this. Now, if you look at the papers of Fuchs and Frobenius, they provide first an algorithm to compute the exp expansion of h1 and h0. And then there are several pages to prove the convergence. Okay. So construction of h0, h1. First, formal expansion. Then, proof of convergence. Okay. Now, as you observe here, the, the initial form has order 2, order 2, as an operator. So here we have a regular singularity at 0. And that's why, that's why you can prove here the convergence. So this uses regularity of 0, the convergence. Formally, you can still do it, yeah? but to prove the convergence, you have to use the regularity. So there are several ingredients. And what I want to show you today is, at least in a relatively simple circumstance, how this can be seen more conceptually. OK, now what about the time? Yeah, we have half an hour. I will erase now everything because I want to formulate and then prove the theorem, the first theorem we are 
looking at so <clears throat> My initial goal when I came to these Fuchsian differential equations, I was not working in, in differential equations, I'm algebraic geometry or analytic geometry. Was, I was just trying to understand what Fuchs and Frobenius did. And then I realized that instead of looking directly for the solutions of the differential equations, it's more convenient or more axiomatic to look at the differential operator alone and to look at the normal form of the differential operator. No? Normal form in a specified sense. This is a concept which appears in many contexts in mathematics, but there is no exact definition what a normal form is. But whenever you have a nice form of something, you say that's a normal form. So in our context, the normal form of our differential operator will be its initial form. Okay? So normal form means here first L0 is a very good approximation of L in a specified sense. And second, when you go on the action, when you act with your operator on a space of functions, let's say on holomorphic functions and logarithms, then this action yeah, can be replaced by the action of L0 by an automorphism of the function space. Okay, so let me write this down in detail. Theorem. So this is <coughs> what we call the normal form theorem. And <coughs> the special case is uh, maximal local exponent. I want to do it gradually, first in this case and later in the more complicated case, <clears throat> so you can really follow what's going on and where are the difficulties and which parts are quite straightforward. So we take L O del, differential operator of order n, and O convergent power series and I will also provide a formal version so let me write O hat for formal power series okay <clears throat> with initial form L0. Now I pick, I pick just one local exponent. Let rho in omega be one chosen local exponent of L at zero. So this will be a complex number. And the assumption is assume that rho is maximal modulo z. What does this mean <clears throat> for all k positive integers? rho plus k is not a local exponent. Okay, so if you add something integral to rho, you run out of your exponents. You don't get the root of your initial polynomial. Now, I pick here just one rho, but you can do it for all rows simultaneously. That's no harm, but I restrict to this case. Now we define our function space, define Script F, we take x to the rho times O. So this is x to the rho Cx. So we have here two ingredients. 
the elements, the monomials would be of the form x to the rho, x to the k, for instance, k in n. Yeah. So whereas rho itself could be complex. Rho is in, R, in C. No? And I also do it simultaneously for the completion. So we will be x to the rho, rho hat, x to the rho, Okay. Now, of course, L will act on both. I don't write it here. No? L will act, so L can be seen either as an abstract operator or as a linear map from F to F. So I assume here, I didn't write it, that the shift is at least zero. Uh, let me add it here, shift of L zero equals zero without loss of generality to simplify my li li life. So <coughs> L then L induces linear map, which I also denote by L from F to F, linear maps, and Maybe I write again L, but you could write L hat from F hat to F hat. Up hat. Okay? And what you want to determine are the kernels. Your solutions are the kernels of this map, but of course only inside F. It depends very much what kind of space you consider. And I just do it for one local exponent row. But you should think of taking the direct sum over all rows, OK? But for simplicity, let me just write it like this. Then there exists a linear automorphism. And first, I will do the formal case. So let me call it u hat from f hat to f hat, a linear automorphism such that if you take now the action of here, L, and you compose it with U inverse, then you get L0. So <clears throat> if you call this V, this would be L composed with V is L0 and V is the inverse of U. But we construct U first and afterwards the inverse, OK? So this is in the formal setting. Now, if you want convergence, you need uh, the assumption of regularity if, in addition, 0 is regular singularity. of L, then U hat induces a linear automorphism U, now going from this F to F, such that now taking this on U gives you L0. OK? That's the statement of the theorem. Assuming, first, that the shift is 0. This is not essential. But we assume that rho is maximal with respect to that. This is not always the case, as we have seen already in examples. OK? So uh, before going to the break, let me, let me tell you a little bit about the impact of this result. Now. As u, let me concentrate on directly on the convergent case. No? This u goes from f to f. So it sends holomorphic functions to holomorphic functions, but they are multiplied with x to 0. I'm not talking at the moment about logarithms. They will come a little bit later. Yeah? So u will send 
this uh, holomorphic factor O to holomorphic factors, and you immediately get the corollary. If y1 equals x to 0 is a solution of L0 y equals 0, and we know it is, so the if means just that rho is in omega, then u inverse of y1, that means x, is a solution of L y equals 0. Okay. Now, you can now look at u. What is u? So the remark is one has a precise control. u is not unique over a suitable u and its inverse v. Control, of course, I mean, what do we mean by control in mathematics if the object is an infinite power series? Yeah? But at least it is explicit. Yeah? And uh, it should be also said that, again, remark, this, is just, this just works for, x, for the solution x rho. What about logarithms? What about? solutions involving logarithms. So solutions of L0, Y equals 0. Then you have a similar statement. I'm not writing it down now. And you can also lift these other ones. Yeah. So similar technique applies. And the final remark, and then we make a short break, is the following. Write L as L0 minus t. The minus is only for notational purposes, with t equal minus L1 minus L2 minus L3, the higher terms of higher shift terms of L of positive shift okay recall that L0 has shift 0 so the the whole key to this is a, an idea or a principle which appears over and over again in mathematics interpret L which is L0 minus t as a sufficiently small perturbation than L0. Interpret L as a small perturbation of L0 by proving that T is negligible, 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 or T is small. Okay. You should think of the following. If you have an invertible matrix, n by n matrix, and if you add a matrix with very small entries, so matrix A plus B, and B has small entries, with respect to A, and A is invertible, then A plus B is also invertible. Okay? And uh, a similar principle holds here as well. So after the break, we will prove this. We will prove this in quite detail. It's not very long. And it should give you a feeling how Fuchs and Frobenius were thinking about these things. So let's have five minutes break, and then we will be back. It will be some half an hour. 
Uh, I will do the proof in a minute, but let us first treat the case of logarithms. So we have theorem prime, which is uh, extended, NFT extended. So <clears throat> situation as before, as in the prior previous theorem. But now we let L act on a bigger space, introduce new variable. We learned this trick already for Euler equation, z, and take O adjoint z as differential ring with derivation del bar from OZ to OZ. So del bar of x is 1, and del bar of z is 1 over x. So z corresponds to the logarithm of x, of course. Now, <clears throat> doing so, uh, we take instead of x rho times o, now take our space f, where we seek our solutions, as x rho o adjoint z. Okay. Then the extension of L, which I denote, whenever I consider z in addition to x, I write underline. So L underline will go from f to f. Yeah, is the action of our operator L on this space. Rho is again fixed, acts. And uh, there exists a linear automorphism. And now I just do it in the convergent case, you know, u from f to f, <coughs> such that L u inverse equals L0, provided that 0 is a regular singularity of L. Otherwise, pass to O hat and F hat. I am not doing this again. So <clears throat> I'm not going to prove this today. Uh, but the corollary is, of course, as before, if rho in omega local exponent of multiplicity m rho, then we get solutions. Then if we take now y1 equals x rho up to y y m rho equals x rho log x m rho minus 1, lift to solutions of L y equals 0 in, and now we have to take x rho o, and we have to take here log of x via 
Yeah, we just pull back u inverse of uh, x to the rho z to the i. Now I write again z instead of logarithm. I pull it back with my u. Now this is an element of f. I pull it back again to f. And this will be substituting z equal log x our solutions. Okay. And we get as many as, <coughs> as we have here multiplicity. Okay. So going from theorem, the first one to this one, is not very complicated. It's a little bit uh, of algebraic manipulations. But also theorem, the first theorem, is not so hard to prove once you have set up your mind. OK? So one thing that one should mention here, that these pullbacks of the solutions, they will not be monomials in the logarithm. There will be now sums of different powers of logarithms appearing, as I have shown you in the example from before, example three from before. So this u kind of spreads out these various monomials. But as we have a precise description of u, there's no harm. So proof of theorem. So <clears throat> afterwards, it looks quite simple. But of course, uh, getting there was uh, not so obvious, even though everything is, is implicit in the works of Fuchs, Tomei, and Fabonius. But you have to formulate it in your own language. So as I said before, write L equals L0 minus T. And uh, we have T positive. And uh, so this implies that T as an operator sends power series or holomorphic functions inside x times o, no? because the shift is positive. This is something we will observe for later. And if you now do it for t x to the rho times o, you will end up in x rho plus 1 times o, okay. to be used later. So of course, you can complain and say that all this is a usual perturbation argument. And it is. But I mean, yeah, it doesn't, I haven't seen, I would have loved to have a, a reference where this kind of proof is given. So L0 goes from our space f, which I just take x rho o. Now, L0 will kill x rho. So this goes actually to xf, which is x rho plus 1 o. Okay. Recall, because L0 of x to the rho is 0. Uh -huh. When you do it in the prime situation, the similar argument works. Now, rho is maximal. So now, by assumption, L0 of x rho plus k is non-zero for k at least 1. You agree? No? There is no more local exponent. But then this means that this will be star times x rho plus k. L0 has shift 0, and this star here is non zero. OK, something. This is the indicial polynomial. But this will be chi of rho plus k, this star here. OK? But this means that this map here, L0, is subjective. Hence, the image 
Now let me write it like this. Hence, L0 from f to xf is surjective. Recall that the image of to t lies also. This was, again, xf. t maps also inside xf. Now, as it is surjective, we can take, it's a linear map, so we can take a kernel, let h be a direct complement of the kernel of L0 inside f. So we restrict L0 to this direct complement, and this will then go from h to xf, and this will be an isomorphism, linear isomorphism. OK. So let me call the inverse s. Call s equal L0 restricted to h inverse. Of course, when I go back, I want that this goes from xf to h, but then I embed it again into f. OK, so I mean the map going into f. So that's all this was easy up to now, and it will not be any more complicated. So we have uh, this s here. And now I'm already able to define our automorphism. U. Yeah. Set. U equal, we take the identity of F minus S composed with T. So this will go from F to F. No, the identity, of course, goes from F to F. T goes from F into XF. And S, which goes back here, goes from XF back to F. So that is well defined. Well defined. Linear. T is what we had before, and here we use here we use the T of use T of F inside XF. Those who are familiar with the constant rank theorem of analysis will recognize that this is a very similar situation. Okay? So we claim that U is an automorphism. Claim U is an automorphism with inverse V, U inverse, given by, now here you have identity minus an operator, a linear map. So you just take the identity plus the geometric series in S composed with T k, k from 1 to infinity. OK? So that's easy to prove in the formal setting. Proof for O hat. So this should go again from f hat to f hat, or from f to f, according to the situation. So in the formal setting, it is clear that this is well defined. V is well defined because whenever you apply S composed with T to an element here, so the T will increase the order in X by 1 at least. Okay? And the S, which is just L0, L S will keep the degree in x. So well-defined because s composed with t 
increases the order, or the degree in x, I should say, the degree in x. It depends if you take monomials or depends if you take monomials or series. Let me call it. It increases the order of series in x. Huh? So <clears throat> just to, to illustrate, to convince you, the order in with respect to x now as a series, t x to the k is at least k plus 1 for any k. And this is not the same k. And s order, s does not decrease it. Let me write here, yeah, x to the k is again k plus 1. Now, when you have the formal power series, this is complete. Cx is complete with respect to the m adic topology or x adic topology. And hence, so I should write here v, hood, v hat, and hence v hat. V is well defined. And it is trivially an inverse to U by the geometric series. And inverse to U had by linearity. We have here a kind of constant rank theorem in the linear case. Everything is linear. So this finishes already the formal setting. Okay for formal power series. Now, this in the sense of the construction of the automorphism. Now we have to show that U does our job. I'm not sure if I will come to the convergent case, but at least I will indicate you. So now comes the fantastic end of this story in the formal, in the formal setting. Where is my? Still to show. You does or you had does the job, which means. That L composed with U hat inverse is L zero. Okay. So now to be more precise, I will write <coughs> write L restricted to F and L restricted to F for the linear maps. From F to F. Just to emphasize that I'm not taking them as abstract operators, but as maps on F. So let us compute. We take, of course, we put U hat to the other side. We have L0 restricted to F composed with u hat. And at the end, here down there, we want to have L, L itself. So this is L0, F, composed with identity of F. And then, by definition, minus S composed with T. And again, I write here the map on F. S is already a map on F, but T is an operator. Okay. But we know what t is. So this is L0 f composed with identity of f minus s composed with 
L0, well, there are too many circles, L0 minus L restricted to F. So map on F is equal. How many lines do I need? Yeah. L0, F, composed with identity of F minus S composed with L0 on F plus S composed with L on F. You agree? I do it very slowly. Now we multiply out. Everything is linear, so we get L0 on F minus L0 composed with S composed with L0 on F plus L0 composed with S composed with L on F. Now, somewhere we have to use how we defined S. So S was an inverse of L0. Yeah? S was an inverse of L0. So this means that this one here, here this will cancel. You just are left with L0 map on F. So these two will cancel. And we are left here with L0 composed with S composed with L with map on F. But again, L0 composed with S will give you the identity. So this is L F. So this is a tautology. That is only writing, no mathematical content. But it proves what you want. So this is the proof in the formal case. You like it? I hope you like it a little bit. I don't have much better to, to, to present. Uh, it's like magic, but it captures in a, in a very precise way what you want to do. Now let me say one more word about the the convergence so maybe one should mention first here that this also works remark this also works for l bar on f equals x rho o z. Precisely the same proof, but the only thing that is more, it's a little bit more challenging, show again that L0 extended from x rho o z to x rho plus 1 o z is subjective. That's pure algebra, but it is a crucial point. Okay. Now, concerning the convergence, what about the convergent case? Now we take f equals x rho o. I omit the logarithms. So the, the choice of s, of s, and this s is called scission, scission of L0, kind of inverse, part of partial inverse, depends on the choice of h, the kernel L0 equals f. So this h is not unique, but you can choose it in the following way. You may choose s. And I just indicate what it does on monomials, x rho plus k equal. Very simple. You just 
take the indigenable normal rho plus k, and then you take the same rho plus k. So it is <coughs> up to the missing shift here, it is an integration operator. Because you divide, you divide by something depending on the exponent. Okay. So if you do this, you get the convergence as follows. Now I have to write a little bit. I think I will first erase here and use my last 10 minutes to indicate you where is the key point for the convergence. So for the convergence, you have to make your hands a little bit dirty, but not very dirty. So this perturbation argument works for formal power series because formal power series are complete with respect to the exadic topology. And this exadic topology is a, a metric topology. You can in, define a metric, and then you have complete metric spaces. Now in the convergence setting, you have to fix the radius of convergence and restrict to power series having this at least this radius of convergence. And this gives you a Banach space. And then you have operators or linear maps between Banach spaces. And in order to show that, that identity minus s composed with t is again an automorphism, you have to show that s composed with t has operator norm with respect to these Banach spaces less than 1. That's again a standard principle in functional analysis, and that's what you have to do here. So you have to show that the coefficients do not increase too fast as you apply s to the s composed with t again and again. And the key, the key uh, thing here is for the convergence, and I just refer you to the notes for the details, observe the following. Let us check what S composed with T does. So T of x rho plus k, k always an integer, is by definition minus some i minus j positive, the shift is positive, rho plus k j falling factorial, then we have the coefficient cij of L, of our differential operator, and then we have here x to the rho plus k plus i minus j. That's t, okay? applied to a monomial. It suffices to look at monomials. Now if you take s composed with t, you have to show that this is not too big. So you get essentially the same minus some i minus g, j positive. But now you have to divide by chi rho plus k. And then you get the same thing, cij x rho plus k plus i minus j. And now comes the clue. So the j which is the derivative, yeah, j is always the variable, the power of the derivative, j goes up to n. j goes from 0 to n. So here, in the numerator, you have a polynomial. Let me put this in red, maybe, if this works. This red stuff is a polynomial in k of degree less than or equal to n, depending on j. What about the numerator? Uh, sorry, the numerator is a polynomial in the k of degree less than or equal to n. And here, the denominator. Now we assume that we have a regu regular singularity. So the initial polynomial has degree k n degree n polynomial in k. 
Yes, this was one characterization of regular singularities. So this means that when you change here, if you vary k, if you let go k to infinity, this term here, this fraction remains bounded. Hence, as k goes to infinity, the red box remains bounded. k remains bounded. Okay. But even better, here this i minus j is positive. Yeah? So you start with the root plus k, and here you add something. Now if you take norms, norms of power series, by substituting x by a small s, if x in absolute value, a complex number is less than s, is 0, and this is sufficiently small. Okay. If x is small, then the s which will which will be left here, yeah, so we get x rho plus k plus i minus j in the s norm will be s rho plus k times uh, less than s to the power 1. Okay, because we win here, we have at least one. S is small. Okay. So we win one S here. If we take S sufficiently small, we have a constant here for every K. So this shows that the norm, the operator norm, S composed with T, with respect to the Banach space obtained by this, this S will be the, a certain radius of convergence, if you want. is less than 1. No? Because whenever s becomes smaller than this constant here, you are less than 1. And then this implies that u inverse equals some s t k. And now you have to indicate polyradius or f, f s, which means power series which have uh, radius of convergence at least s. Uh, is well defined. Is well defined plus continuous between Banach spaces. So I hope that you see the various ingredients in this proof. You have an algebraic part, you have the Euler equation solutions, you have this perturbation argument, you have a formal argument using the exotic topology, and then here you use Banner spaces. This cannot be avoided, uh, but it's in the most elegant way to do it. Okay, so that's everything for today. I got a little bit excited. I hope that you liked it also, and I will hopefully have the notes ready by the end of the week so you can look up the details. And next week, we are going to the following question. What happens if rho is not maximal modulo z? Then it's a little bit more complicated. And that took me quite a while to understand it because it's very hard to extract from the literature. But I think I understand it now, and I will tell you next time. Everything for today. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful evening, day, night, whatever. And I'm happy if you send me from time to time an email or give me some feedback. And see you hopefully next week. Bye-bye. Thanks. See you next week.